And the, the next speaker is Hosanna Mello. She's from the Federal University of Juice de Flora. She uh, gained her uh, master's and PhD here in UFMG in the cell biology program. Uh, she did postdoctoral work at Harvard and uh, for many, many years has continued that, that collaboration. She is often there every time I try to call her, she's usually in, in Harvard. So she uh, continues to work there on a, on a project. So she investigates uh, cell secretory and endocytic cell mechanisms and pathways involved in inflammation and infectious diseases, especially in the, uh, in the case of eosinophils. She uses advanced imaging techniques. She's done this for many years, uh, very early on with uh, electron microscopy, basic electron microscopy, and now she's moved over into 3D volume EM using tomography, and I'm not sure if other techniques she'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, she's also known here in Brazil. She's published several books uh, on microscopy, some of them more directed toward eosinophils, others on basic microscopy and electron microscopy. And she's been on, on many scientific committees, uh, cell biology. I can't tell you all the names of them. I don't remember them in my head, but she's also at the moment on the committee uh, evaluating projects at the LA Nano projects for cryo-EM. So uh, uh, she's also for, almost forgot to say that she's also, we've worked recently, uh, she's the co-PI on the CZI project that's funding this whole, whole system, our studies and, and the workshops. So uh, very active in the research, uh, in bioimaging research committee, uh, community. Thank you very much, Hazana, for participating. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to share my... Are you seeing my... Hazana, you're still in, uh, I think. Okay. Okay, okay. it's good. Um, hi everyone, I'm a cell biologist who has been applying electron microscopy for over 20 years to study cells of the immune system in health and disease. My research group is interested in understanding how immune cells respond to inflammatory situations, including infectious diseases, by investigating basic biological mechanisms. We observe the behavior of individual cells, such as eosinophils, our preferred cells now, to get insights into the cell function. Our studies are focused on um, cell secretion, uh, can you see my pointer? Identify um, how immune cells uh, release their products, features of cell activation. I'm going to talk about this later, su such as changes in secretory granules, interorganelle interactions, vesicular trafficking, processes of cell death. Uh, the compartments where the immune mediators are stored and uh, 3D structural organization of organelles. To understand all of these processes, we apply um, conventional TM. That is still a powerful technique to respond to several questions, research questions, immune or undergoed EM, and 3D electron tomography. Applications of both conventional and um, advanced EM techniques have provided substantial insights into the structural organization, the cellular content of biomolecules, and functional capabilities of immune cells. But these applications require 
require critical, critical attention with the samples. Our samples involve tissues, cell suspension, cell cultures, uh, cell monolayers, peripheral blood, and there are many, many technical uh, challenges in the initial stages uh, of sample collection. Our ability to get, um, just a moment, our ability to get optimal material, interpretable material for research depends greatly on how the samples are handled from the beginning. Key points involve special care in sample manipulation, precise fixation, accurate sample collection and processing. For example, how do you prepare blood for TEM? Blood is frequently used to study immune cells, uh, leukocytes. How do you prepare um, adherent cells? So as you can see on the screen, we are um, performing embedding directly on the glass slide. We are doing EM directly on the, on the chamber slides, and we use this when um, we are uh, observing, studying phenomena such as release of extracellular traps. So classically, extracellular traps uh, are, are studied by scanning uh, EM, as you can see on the top of, of the, the screen, but we are applying TEM to cut and see these extracellular traps, the ability of the cells to release extra, extracellular traps in situ. So we perform, we do the embedding directly uh, on the cell, on the, on the slide surface. So um, another point I'd like to make is that Every single image captured by TM reflects at high resolution a moment of the cell lifetime. After so many years, I can resist and give advice. <laughs> I'm seeing so many students here in this workshop, and I had to tell you, spend to spend time analyzing your samples, hours, days is very important. We analyze carefully, um, I don't know what, I, I, we analyze carefully each image. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm having problems today with the, okay. I was talking about my advice um, to take time to analyze um, here. Okay. Um, what I was, the point I was making is that when I was analyzing this image, it's an electron micrograph from an eosinophil. I was taking a look at the granules to analyze secretory, secretory mechanisms. And then I saw these beautiful extracellular vesicles being formed at the cell surface. And uh, so this single picture was the start point of a paper we published in 2016 demonstrated the first demonstration that microvesicles can be produced from um, eosinophils in response to stimulation. TEM is very informative in demonstrating the complex secretory activities of immune cells. Why? Why is this important? This is important because 
Secretary Mechanisms underlie immune cell functions. Immunosinophils, the secretory granules, are sites in which granule, granule uh, uh, products are stored. Interleukins, chemokines, growth, growth factors, cationic proteins. Eosinophils are involved in many functions and health and disease. And these functions are all based on the type of molecule that is released after stimulation and during the, the normal life of the eosinophils, depending on the microenvironment, depending on the stimuli, eosinophils can select the type of molecule uh, that this, uh, it, it's being released. So it's important to understand the, the secretion, how it, the cell secretes. One uh, TM is the only technique with resolution sufficient to clearly identify and distinguish between different modes of cell secretion. So, exocytosis, the classical exocytosis, you can see one granule is fused with the plasma membrane. Um, you can see on the top here or compound exocytosis when granules fused each other. These uh, processes are not common, commonly find in, in, found in, in disease. They are not very frequent in vivo. The most frequent uh, processes of uh, secretion in vivo include spicimil degranulation and uh, cytolysis. So spicimil degranulation you see this beautiful eosinophil migrating through the epithelium, the intestinal epithelium, almost there, almost uh, reaching the lumen. And you can observe that the granules are not fused. But you can see that the granules are mobilized. The, 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 the cell is um, undergoing content losses inside this granule is, is being released. The core, the typical core, electron dense core of the eosinophils is disarranged. And you see this, they, uh, the granules become, become more electron um, lucid, lucent. You can see on the right, the, a granule that the membrane, the, the limiting membrane is intact, but the core is almost empty. How? eosinophils mobilize how the cell, the content specific cytokines that are stored inside the granules go, are re released at uh, the cell surface. So we are interested in understanding these mechanisms. TM is also helpful uh, to detect cytolysis regarding eosinophils cytolysis is considered not only just a um, process of cell death, but also a process, a process to release granules. So in the initial cytolysis, you see uh, EM is helpful to show the plasma membrane, initial disruption of the plasma membrane. And um, late cytolysis, you see entire granules and these granules remain in the tissue and are considered they are active. They release products uh, even after the, the cell, after, even after the cell death. This is an image from uh, a gastric carcinoma. So PCMU and cytolysis are very frequent in many diseases. One advantage of TM is that there are remarkable ultrastructural differences between resting and activated immune cells. Cell organelles can change their morphology during inflammatory responses. Cell organelles and structures can be uh, is particularly formed during inflammatory responses, for instance, lipid droplets, um, 
large vesicular caries, I'm going to talk about it. And the good thing is that you can quantitate these differences. So regarding granules, eosinophil secretory granules undergo dramatic changes upon activation. And if you see arresting eosinophils compared with um, uh, eosinophil stimulated with, for instance, eotexin, CCL11, the number of granules didn't, didn't change, but you can see the ultra structure of the granules, remarkable difference. And you can quantitate intact, emptying, and fused granules to get insights about the functioning of the, the cell. We have, we do a lot, many, many um, uh, analysis. Uh, we quantify granule morphology, granule numbers and sizes, cytoplasmic area occupied by granules, number of intact granules, number of um, granules showing PCO degranulation. So here you, you have a panel with different ways and you see the trilunar membrane, uh, the limiting granule membrane, but the content, there are different stages, degrees of granule releasing their products. Um, another uh, organelle very responsive to inflammation is the lipid body, also the name lipid body or lipid droplets. So inflammatory stimuli lead to the lipid body formation in leukocytes. So by using different stimuli, you can see um, uh, beautifully these this lipid bodies. The electron density of these lipid bodies change depending on the, the cell type and the cell stimulation. In eosinophils, these are eosinophils, lipid bodies are very electron dense. In vivo, you can see, uh, for instance, for example, this is an inflammatory macrophage in the heart of an experimental model of Chagas disease. So infection, infect, infectious diseases, uh, it's very common to see macrophages full of lipid bodies and very activated compared to a rest in macrophage. Uh, TM offers an advantage to, for the study of lipid bodies, because as you can see on the screen, lipid bodies don't have a bilayer membrane. They are not surrounded by a bilayer membrane. And then you don't need to use markers for, to study lipid bodies. So we, um, published several published several papers, many papers demonstrated that lipid bodies are organelles linked to inflammatory responses. And you can apply um, morphometric analysis, lipid body number, size, electron density, and also interaction with other organelles. Uh, we performed experiments using just light microscopy that we didn't see difference in numbers of lipid bodies between um, non-activated and activated cells. But by M, you can get other features like uh, the size of lipid bodies. You can increase it a lot. Even if the number was not increased, the size can be increased and you can, can measure the, the diameter of these lipid body, bodies. We have uh, found lipid bodies with the size of the nucleus. It's very impressive. And um, this is important because lipid bodies are sites for the production of inflammatory mediators. This is uh, very uh, well documented that when you have an inflammatory stimulus, there is a lipid body biogenesis, 
and inside the lipid bodies, there are sources of arachidonic acid. And by with the stimulation, there is expression of enzymes linked to the pathway for the synthesis of inflammatory mediators. And lipid bodies um, inside the cells in response to, to inflammation can um, interact with other organ organelles. So EM is very helpful to enable visualize these interactions. For example, the interaction between lipid body and phagosome containing parasites or other pathogens, which is considered uh, now a um, mechanism for pathogen, pathogen survival uh, strategy. In response to inflammation, other structures like such as large, that they are, we colored in pink, large uh, vesicular tubular structures increase are formed in response to cell activation. In eosinophils, we have, uh, we are studying, we have a special interest on these, in these uh, structures until 2005. These, they are very large. They have around um, um, 300 nanometers and diameter. And um, until 2005, they were considered microgranules. There are still, I still find uh, several reviews saying, oh, eosinophils have microgranules that they increase during um, inflammatory situations, but in fact, these micrograms, micrograms, granules are vesicular tubular uh, structures, and they are produced, they are generated from the granules, and we're going to talk later about it, and when apply inflammatory stimuli, uh, you can count and quantitate this, uh, these vesicles. And even extracellular uh, vesicles at the cell surface can be quantitated, identified, they are very small, and quantitated. Here, one uh, paper we published in which we apply different stimuli. And if you use inflammatory stimuli, you, the number of nascent um, extracellular vesicles increase at the cell surface, and, and also not only the number of free, but also the number of budding extracellular vesicles at the cell surface. These are specifically microvesicles because they are produced directly from the plasma membrane and not from the multivesicular bodies. TEM uniquely enables imaging of the object of interest at high resolution in its structural context. This is especially relevant when you are studying cells of the immune system in tissues, because you can take a look at the microenvironment and find clues about the functional activities of these cells. You can take a look what's going on around that cell you, you are studying. So you can visualize, visualize different cell types on this, in this uh, micrograph. You can see an eosinophil, that's typical morphology, a lymphocyte, a mass, mass cell. You can uh, detect cell to tissue alterations, cell to cell interactions, cell to cell interactions are very insightful in situations of disease. In this electromicrograph, you see an eosinophil in the intestine, in colites, in a biopsy a patient with um, a biopsy of a patient with colites. And we colored in purple plasma cells. It's, it's amazing. You see, uh, eosinophil surrounded by plasma cells, so it's very insightful because um, 
eosinophil can be uh, this interaction, the meaning of this interaction in the intestine. It's you have some clues, né? you know by the the the, uh, the literature that eosinophils can promote the persistence, the survival of plasma cells, and you are now studying these in other uh, situations. You can um, cell to cell interactions here in the skin of a patient with hyperosinophilic syndrome. You see physical interaction between one eosinophil and a macrophage. So uh, this context, in the context of tissues, you can also apply um, quantitative analysis to count the cell numbers, cell shape changes, activation signs, distribu distribution of cell organelles uh, per tissue area. We recently published a paper in which we investigated extracellular traps formation by infiltrated eosinophils in tissues during, during inflammatory disease. Vitor Davis, a PhD student from my lab and colleagues, did a fantastic job analyzing, analyzing extensive tissue areas, identifying and quantitate early and late signs of etiosis. Etiosis is a term meaning cell death with a cytolytic profile with extrusion of extracellular traps, DNA, uh, nucleus originated DNA. So um, they quantitate in the each disease the amount of these uh, signs, including early signs, because have you ever wondered, when you see extracellular traps, I think everyone is familiar with the extracellular traps, it's a filamentous, it's a elongated um, chromatin that is extru extruded from the cell, it's released, what's going on, what happened before uh, that extrusion. So in biopsies, in this is eosinophilic diseases, uh, we were looking this in eosinophils. You, you chose these diseases because they are characterized by high number of eosinophils, infiltrated eosinophils in tissues. So the early signs of eosinophil etiosis involve, involve dramatic nuclear changes. If you compare in the letter A, the, the normal common, the conventional nucleus, you see electron dense, um, heterochromatin and L-chromatin, electron lucent, and this nuclei, they, they decondense, they undergo a delobulation, they become rounding, and see in the, the G in the, this letter, you see round nucleus, and then uh, you can have uh, a series of phenomena. So we can have disruption of the nuclear envelope or the plasma membrane and the release of extracellular traps. So with this early and late signs of HOs, we character characterized what we uh, termed the ultra-structural ultra signature of etiosis. So it was published um, this year in July, very, very recently. To get more insights into how immune cells uh, pack and uh, release mediators, immune mediators during immune response, we, we need to apply molecular detection methods combined with EM. So yes, we do immuno nanobolds. I'm saying <laughs> this way because people, this is one, it's very challenging technique. 
And people keep saying, oh, do you do immunoglobulin? Oh, it's very difficult. I consider one of the most challenging techniques in cell biology. So we developed a protocol in which we um, developed strategies for ultrastructural and antigen preservation. These are two things that they, they don't combine, or you have, you get good preservation morphological and bad antigen preservation, or you get good preservation antigen and bad morphology. So to combine these two things, because yes, we want to see your antibody, the, the places that to localize your protein, but you need good morphology. So in this protocol, we uh, develop this strategy, robust blocking of non-specific binding sites, improved antibody penetration, and quick EME procedures. So um, what do we do? We get cryosections in letter A, and you perform, we do all the immunolabeling. So they use the primary antibody, this, the secondary antibody before, before EM procedures. So that's, that's why it's termed pre-embedding, before embedding. So we do all the procedures on the surface of this cryo section. The embedding is, uh, is done this way, so you get the, the resin blocks, uh, you, you, I use um, liquid nitrogen to detach the blocks from the cell surface. And, and then this step, the step of um, the EM procedure, the regular EM procedure lasts just two hours. Uh, and then um, not counting the polymerization that you, you can use 16 hours. So the block you can cut and analyze. So one of the strat strategy we use, use a very fag fab fragment, not the, the entire um, antibody as a secondary. You, we use very small gold particles, um, 1.4 nanometers. And using this technique, we have been identifying cytokines, cationic proteins, receptors, theta spannings, and, and, and many other proteins. Oh, I have to tell that because it's too small, 1.4, you cannot see pretty well. And then you uh, have to do I stage. The name is silver enhancement to increase the size of the gold particles. So we have been applying this immunogold technique, uh, especially to identify um, um, proteins in vesicular compartments. Like this was the first, this is one cell that was stimulated with uh, inflammatory stimuli. As you may know, MBP is major basic protein. It is in, inside the granules. So until this paper, uh, that this was the first identification of a vesicle-based transport of MBP from using fuse, because you see vesicles being budding off from the granule until the cell surface. Um, on the bottom, bottom of these pictures, we isolated these vesicles, we call sombrero vesicles, by subcellular fractionation, they, they, they work, they function as pools of um, MBP. So we also studied the lo localization of cytokines like interferon gamma, it was found in granules and also in um, vesicular tubular structures. Uh, this technique was very helpful to identify receptors like 
IL-4 receptor. So we labeled IL-4 in granules and vesicles and IL-4 receptors. It was the first demonstration of um, in, in cytoplasmic IL-4 receptor. And based on this paper, we proposed a model uh, to explain how using film select a specific molecule from the granule to the cell surface. So after uh, under stimulation, the receptors sequester and chaperone cytokines into vesicles. And these vesicles um, through V-snare and T-snares, they uh, transport the, that specific cytokine until the cell surface. So we have also applied interested um, tetraspanins like CD63. CD63 CD is considered a marker for secretion, but the function of this tetraspanin is not very well known. There is a marker. CD63 appears at the cell surface, and it, you can say, oh, this cell, this immune cell is secreting. But by applying immunogold, we observed that the major pores of CD63 remains inside the cell and, in fact, acts as a facilitator to um, associate with both PCMU and uh, compound exocytosis. We have been labeling uh, extracellular vesicles using markers for extracellular vesicles like CD63 and CD9. And more recently, we had this um, huge study to identify galactin 10 in the eosinophils. Galactin 10, it's a molecule that composes charcoalide in crystals. This molecule, eosinophils contain stores of galactin 10, as demonstrated by proteomic studies, about 10% of the protein contents of eosinophils are galactin 10, and there is um, a lot of interest in understanding how eosinophils release galactin 10, because this molecule has been used as a biomarker of eosinophil involvement in inflammation. However, so far until this paper, no clue where galactin 10 was lo localized inside eosinophils. So just to, to show you what I'm going, uh, what I'm saying in diseases where there are many cytolytic eosinophils, it's very common these crystals. Um, surrounding eosinophils, very close to release the granules. On the right, you can see that CLCs are labeled for galactin 10. And the question is where is localized? So we performed exactly this protocol I described, and we found a very interesting localization for galactin 10. We were expecting to find galactin 10 inside the granules, but not. Galactin 10 was stored on the peripheral cytoplasm. We applied a uh, super hair solution. That is a super technique as I uh, explained before. And um, we published this paper say, uh, making the point that galactin 10 is not stored in granules, but resides in the peripheral cytoplasm. It, it was not easy to defend this because everything about eosinophils uh, researchers think that it's inside the granules. Uh, this, in this paper, um, Thiago Silva, that's our collaborator, did a lot of um, morphometric analysis. We found that galactin 10 interacted with the plasma membrane and formed like micro domains and uh, he quantitated these micro domains and also after application of inflammatory stimuli because this image the, the images i showed you before was from resting eosinophils 
Galactin then is stored um, in eosinophils. But what happens if you stimulate the cells? Nothing. If you stimulate the cells with the same stimuli that induce granule release, galactin then uh, keep the same localization. So most of the galactin is local, 80% uh, is at the peripheral cytoplasm. So we asked how, how galactin then is released from human eosinophils. So we performed um, the same immunolabeling technique but induce cytolysis. We knew that cytolysis is one of mechanism that mechanism that eosinophil uses to release granules. So after, before uh, membrane disruption, we induced uh, cytolysis. Galactin then is located, localized at the peripheral cytoplasm. And after disruption, you see galactin then Around what is this? These are extracellular vesicles. So this technique, the immunogold, was very helpful to demonstrate that eosinophils store galactin inside the cytoplasm and release after cell disruption, and the extracellular vesicles can um, function as early sites for galactin 10 nucleation crystallization. And today uh, we have just, this was, I'm saying today because I got, it was published yesterday, a paper, a review. I have been interacting with a fantastic group in Japan and they are very interested in understanding the role of galactin 10 in eosinophilic diseases. So they work with patients and they discovered that galactin 10 can be not only diffuses in the tissues, but can be localized, can be detected and measured in the serum, in the serum of patients. So galactin 10 now is being considered a potential biomark for um, eosinophilic disease. Uh, now, talking about the architecture of immune cells, organelles, we are very interested in applying um, techniques, 3D electron tomography to understand more about these inflammatory organelles, these organelles that respond to inflammation inside immune cells. Um, so it was uh, discussed in pre previous talks, electron tomography is a technique to get a 3D image from a specimen, uh, in, in our case, cells, uh, tissues, macromolecules. And um, this is important because you can uh, have more clues about the organization, the interorganelle interaction, short-lived membrane uh, events, and uh, very briefly, e uh, tomography is done in three steps. The first one is the data acquisition. So we, what we do is to have a section around uh, 200 nanometers to 400 nanometers. This material. This sample is tilted in a, in a um, transmission and electron microscope at 200 kV. And this tilt, by tilting, you can collect multiple two dimensional images, record these images. And the second step is about how to align. Images are aligning with each other and reconstructed. Uh, and you can get a 3D volume termed tomogram, tomogram. So tomogram, it's a stack of images that are all parallel to each other. And then you can, um, each image, this each image has just four nanometer thick. So it's wonderful to get this reconstruction. And the third step is to get the modeling. So 
I removed some videos it was, that was were very heavy, but uh, I'd like to talk what we found first. Secretory granules in eosinophils are not just storage compartments. We found membranes inside the granules. Um, so they are compartmentalized organelles. And this is, these membranes are organized as a tubular network. This is very um, impressive for us because you can, can explain that uh, how the, the products inside the granules can be um, mobilized, that the granule can. So uh, we also studied the... Uh, we also... Oh, there is a microphone that's open. <laughs> we also studied the uh, organization of the sombrero vesicles. These sombrero vesicles, by conventional TM, you can see surround the granules. So we analyzed and by uh, tomography and found that USVs can be formed from eosinophil secretory granules. So it's very interesting. Uh, these are var, uh, several um, tomographic slices. So this is a, I got one, 55. And then the same tomogram, you can see how, um, like it's 155 section, you see how these are different. Unfortunately, I had to take out the movie that was too heavy for this presentation. And when we combine all of these techniques, then you can get insights into the cellular content and transport. So EOSVs, these large uh, transport vesicles, you see very frequently in biopsies. Look at this image. You have two granules. One is a resting granule. You see the core indicated by this. Um, it's a small granule, and when the granule is, this is a regular uh, size, but when this, the granule is releasing the products, you see a lot, many uh, sombrero vesicles surround this granule. So by, apl by applying these three technologies, immunogold, you label, you can see what is the, this tubular carriers are transporting material from the granule. And uh, tomography showed that uh, this, this uh, tubular carriers can be formed. And what's more impressive, what was more impressive for me was the fact that these tubular carriers, EOSVs, are very plastic. They are not completely closed. They are open, tubular, and they move very fast in the cytoplasm. This is great because you can imagine it. How difficult should it be for the cell to disarrange this very intricate crystal inside the granule? So if eosinophils respond very fastly, quickly to inflammatory stimuli. So what we, we have, what eosinophils have are pools of immune mediators stored uh, on this, inside this uh, tubular carriers. And under the stimulation, these tubular, these uh, carriers, these vesicles, they move fastly from the granule to the cell surface. So we have also applied electron tomography to understand um, lipid bodies. We also found membranes inside the lipid bodies, and this is this can explain why proteins are membrane proteins are stored inside the lipid bodies. The core of lipid bodies are not just lipids. There are different proteins inside and uh, it's not easy to uh, visualize by regular TM. So electron tomography showed that the core of the lipid body uh, is composed 
of membranes. Oh, finally, um, finally, we applied both uh, conventional TEM and electron tomography to investigate mitochondrial dynamics in the context of inflammatory disease. We know very well that transmission electron microscopy is the technique of choice to visualize in detail the mitochondrial architecture. Um, so, do mitochondria within immune cells respond to inflammatory conditions? Mitochondria are not well understood in the context of immune cells, are poorly understood. So we used mice models of disease, um, uh, allergic, this, we chose this disease because all of them are characterized by infiltration, by recruitment of eosinophils and activation of eosinophils. So we used a mouse, a mouse model of asthma, schistosomiasis mansoni, and influenza and A virus, A H1N1. There are many points, many results, different results from these studies, but I'm gonna focus just on two points. One, there, there was remarkable mitochondrial crystal remodeling in response to inflammatory diseases. So we studied the, the cells in the tissue context. And it's so interesting because in the micro, depending on the microenvironment, you can see the graphs. If you compare the control with the disease, the, the number of uh, the morphology of the crystal changes. So there is a crystal remodeling inside eosinophils. Uh, we found three patterns of crystal, lamellar, mixed, and what we show, we call mist, mixed and tubular. In this tomogram, you can see lamellar, that's most common uh, crystal morphology. And in addition to this remodeling, we found, I'm not showing, but the, there was increase of the numbers of crystals depending on the microenvironment and inter-organelle -organ interaction. So it was interesting to find, um, we quantitated, Mitochondria, mitochondria interaction, mitochondria ER, it's very common, very well documented that mitochondria can interact with the endoplasmic reticulum. But the new thing is that we identified in response to inflammatory diseases, a consistent mitochondria uh, granule contact sites so depending, we quantitated, you can see by the graphs that these sites, and I'm talking about physical, physical contacts, not just to be around physical, membrane to membrane. So the contact mitochondrial granules increase in all of these three inflammatory diseases. And the most important, uh, these contacts increase especially in granules undergoing content losses. So our question was, are mitochondria interfering, regulating inflammatory responses? So this is a question <laughs> that would be, uh, we are addressing in, in future student, uh, studies. And it, it's very interesting to know that because mitochondria can be influencing um, the release of immune mediators from, from granules in eosinophils in response to inflammatory response, uh, diseases. So with this question, I, I finished my presentation. Um, I 
I'm deeply grateful to several agencies that has been supporting the studies of my group. And um, I'd like to thank um, many collaborators, especially Peter Weller from Harvard Medical School and Enzi Vodaki. We worked together for many years, still work. Uh, Enzi Vodaki is now uh, retired. Is a, a very uh, famous pathologist. Uh, my many thanks to Shige Haruek from Akita University that has been working with Yusno Fields, Lisa Spencer, and Amali Saramasing, that is from Tennessee um, University. Uh, from, the UF, from here, I have many collaborators at UFMG. Elio Chiarini Garcia has been working with me. It's a wonderful morphologist. Um, Josiane Neves, that's another uh, person that worked with Yosino Fields and many others I did on the site. Uh, I'd like to thank um, CAPI and uh, Centro de Microscopia, Centro de Microscopia da UFMG, Microscope Center from UFMG. Um, the places who have been doing a lot of analysis and um, the, I also would like to deeply thank my group, my lab, the members of my lab, the past and present members. I have a fantastic team. So this is uh, a big selfie. And they are wonderful people that have been putting a lot of effort into our uh, studies. And if you are interested in using films, I have just published this book all about using films, completely dedicated to using films, the ultra structure, 20 years of research with Andy Vorek and Peter Weller um, at Harvard. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Thank you, Rosana, for uh, the amazing presentation. Um, great data, beautiful images. Uh, I wouldn't expect less from you. And uh, <laughs> also for uh, clearly pointing out how microscopy techniques are complementary, right? Not excluded. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have some, a couple of questions here. Uh, do, do you have time to answer them? Yes, I do. Uh, so one is from Valeria. Uh, Hosanna, did your group identify proteins expressed in the phospholipid monolayer in inflammation or in other situations? Spe specifically, the fat derivative proteins like 26 or 27? Uh, no, haven't applied. It's um, it's interesting, but specifically uh, these proteins we haven't. We we applied several proteins, but not those those ones. So it should be interesting. Okay, uh, another question from Patrice. And uh, just to, I'm saying this uh, in lipid bodies we have. I'm oh, sorry, um, I didn't see this, sorry. Yeah, I'm seeing the, the chat here. In the lipid bodies, we applied uh, immunogold to detect perilipins. So, not the, those ones. It's not easy. It, it's not easy to detect proteins in lipid bodies. We have now, we are not working on a paper because lipid bodies are also sites for cytokines. And we are, are working on a, on a paper when we detect the cytokines in lipid bodies, but it's very, it's very um, challenging to preserve lipid bodies. So that story that I said in the beginning about to think about how to, to manipulate your samples is, is very important for when you are trying to detect proteins in lipid bodies. 
Can you stop sharing your screen, Hosanna, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to find where. <laughs> if you if if you don't, I don't worry. <coughs> yeah, but I think that you can't see. Can we share? I'm say I'm seeing just the, the, the chat here. Just one moment. Yeah, I'm fine. fine. <laughs> Uh, the other question is have, from Patricia Lima. Have tubular vesicles been demonstrated in other local sites beyond eosinophil? Um, we have especially this, this special tubular carrier we consider unique to eosinophils, this sombrero vesicles. So I have to explain. Tubular vesicles are common in other leukocytes. Uh, very common for transportation from Golgi complex, for instance. But this is, has a special morphology, and you call it sombrero because it looks like a, ha a Mexican hat. And we found just in using the fields. It's so specific, it's so unique, unique that um, you can uh, say that the cell is a eosinophil based on the presence of the subular carrier. So we didn't investigate it in other, other leukocytes, but um, uh, this is specific, just eosinophils. In other leukocytes, you can find, find the regular tubular just uh -huh. to see the regular, but this one you can see in uh, even on the tissue, spread spread on the tissue. We have now a student that's working labeling in biopsies because we believe <laughs> that that granule that is uh, spread that is released by cytolysis that is still active release sombrero vesicles in the tissue. And then it's another mechanism, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, another question from Thiago Silva. Rosana, regarding infectious diseases, are you applying TEM to study how eosinophils secrete in schistosoma monsoni? Um, yes, we are, we are interested in everything about eosinophil. Uh, and schistosomiasis mansoni is one disease that is plenty of eosinophils. We study granulomas, and you can find we quantitate the number of cells in six, six, six zero percent of the cells. All immune cells in the granuloma are lipid are um, eosinophils. So we applied TM, but just TM to analyze in human, in biopsies. Now it's very difficult to find biopsies from patients with this disease and um, a mouse model of the disease. And it's interesting because you are revisiting some concepts in the 70s. They based on uh, in vitro studies eosinophil degranulation was considered exocytosis. They said, oh, eosinophil can kill the parasite by releasing by exocytosis. But in vivo, by our analysis, no 1.5, 1 2% of exocytosis. So eosinophils by analyzed by TEM, by our analysis, morphometrics, metric, we found PCMU degranulation and cytosis, not exocytosis. And in a mouse model of Chastomyces mansonis, we labeled MBP and also found MBP in this large tubular vesicles. So we have been applying, we have many questions, including to understand the, 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 the function of eosinophils. And every, everyone classically considered their eosinophil as an effector cell, but the tendency now 
what's been discussing based in a series of evidence is that eosinophil is much more an immunomodulatory cell than a effector cell. Uh, I have a question, oh, Osana. I have the opportunity to. It was nice to see the 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 reconstruction of the mitochondria from Sinchas' work uh, about the remodeling of the cristae. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if uh, you guys have already figured out if this is structural remodeling has to do with function. I mean, you, you, you said that uh, might be related with the, the granules release, but mm -hmm. what exactly do you think that uh, remodeling the cristae has to do with this? So I, I, I didn't, um, you are wondering about the shape of the crystal? Yeah, because you, you described three different uh, shapes, right? Yeah, so it, it's, we got, for instance, we found, uh, I didn't enter into all the results because so, so many evaluations. It's interesting because we compared undifferentiated eosinophils in culture and eosinophils in tissues, in disease. So the mitochondria in tissue, we found Oops, she froze. I don't know if we froze or she froze. I think she froze. I think right? she froze. <laughs> <laughs> we never know if, that, if it's our fault, right? <laughs> Crystal can, can, can change the number of, of uh, of CRISPR can change depending on the microenvironment. Mm -hmm. It's a very open field for people that are working on immune cells because mitochondria is very well studied in several cells, in several situations, but not in immune cells. Nice. And mitochondria have functions that go beyond, much more beyond energy production and other functions. It's a multifunctional organelle. So, uh, I'm telling this because I'm seeing many students here <laughs> from my group that this is open to analyze, to investigate how they respond. So uh, your model is, what's your mo cell model? You are saying. I'm sorry? You, you were explaining your cell model that you are studying this 3D reconstruction, is that? Acacia, Malta, is it possible to do 3D reconstruction of our entire cell to study interaction or just organelles? I think it's pretty clear that you can see the whole cell. Right? Yeah, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe the entire cell is very complicated, but I have seen um, more, much more than um, 400 nanometers. So the block, the, 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 the size of the block, the tomogram, uh, it's thick, but the entire cell, it's, it's, I don't think that's uh, feasible <laughs> because uh, it's so, it's so uh, thick, it's uh, so complex. And nine, the eosinophil has uh, around nine um, to 10 micrometers. So to, to do the entire, it would be yeah, very interesting. What I have seen was to, to cut, to split at least in three parts, and then you try to combine. But the entire cell, um, I think is not that feasible. Not, uh, it's visually possible, but not. I don't know. Uh, um, oh, someone is saying that's no audio here. Um, yeah. Oh, it's better. Can you hear us, Chris? Yes, no problem. Yeah. But now she, I think you lost her. No, are you there, Mosana? 
Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, ah, now I got it. Mikita is asking. Could you please uh, indicate any specialist or group specialist in the use of 3D reconstruction software using tomograms? Uh, yes, I can. I can indicate um, with uh, my students. I have a student here, but Kenneth Bonjour, but he um, that worked with us uh, at Harvard. I have some. I know some people there that doing this. There are no. There is no. No many people around the world, people, students, <laughs> to do this. It's very, very complicated. Not very complicated, but it, it's, uh, you have to have a lot of patience and dedication to study. I couldn't resist and give an advice in the beginning, say, if you are working with EM, you have to spend time, patience to analyze um, your samples and to get insights. I can send to you, uh, Nikita, about oh, great. information. I think he would appreciate that. And uh, there is a question from Livia. Have you, be, have, have you been able to identify specific proteins in the membranes inside lipid body? Hello. Okay, Hello. Now I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. you Your image question? was frozen. Yeah. <laughs> did you listen to the question? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Um, we are. We have done by light microscopy or regular cytochemistry the identification of enzymes linked to inflammatory mediators. Andy Vorek worked at uh, that pathologist from my group. She demonstrated before some enzymes by uh, convention, by immunogold, but she applied post embedding, it worked for her for this specific purpose uh, to identify these enzymes. In my experience, I have just localized because it was not my interest not to go through these enzymes that they were demonstrated before. So this we localize. Um, it, it's really another, another lipid bodies are sites for the synthesis of inflammatory mediators, but we don't know yet, don't know how this, how this inflammatory mediators, prostaglandins, for instance, are released from lipid bodies to the cell surface. So we believe that there is a um, traffic, a membrane traffic from from. proteins inside lipid bodies is one of our future uh, studies. Any more questions? So um, thank you again, Hosanna, and uh, thank you everybody who stick with us today. And uh, I hope to see you all tomorrow when we are going to have our last section um, to close our event. We are going to have a, a morning section about high contact imaging and multiplex imaging techniques. And in the afternoon, we are going to go out a little bit uh, uh, of microscopy 
but we will still uh, we'll talk about bioimage, but bioimaging applied to medical diagnostic. Uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the day like we did here. And uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>